So, thanks for your patience. Um, today we're looking at chapter four, and Angus has volunteered to introduce this chapter for us, uh, The World as Percept. So, uh, Angus, lead us in, and then, as usual, we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, yeah, it, um, it's a big chapter, isn't it? Um, it's, a, it's a very big chapter. I'm going to try and break it down into uh, five areas. That's, that's like how it falls out uh, for me. Um, and it'll be it's like in sequential order and um, also raise a couple of interesting thought processes that, that arose in me as, uh, as I read it multiple times. So he starts off, he talks about the activity of thinking and uh, that it's this activity that is that which generates concepts and ideas and that um, words are only um, evidence that we have concepts, they are not concepts in themselves. And he then goes on to describe how in this sense that he, uh, he has a different uh, although in essence concepts and um, ideas are produced by thinking, this is how he differs from Hegel because Hegel uh, posits this as sort of like the, the foundation of, of everything. Um, he then takes us into the example with Herbert Spencer and uh, the partridge, um, which in me is like similar in tone to the uh, the tree moving and the tree not moving that he talked about with uh, Goethe in, in, in chapter two, that thinking has, thinking is this activity which it, uh, it, do, it only unfurls itself if we have questions, if, um, if we don't ask questions about the environment, so like it's, it'll just do its own thing. But it's, it's this um, activity, we have no obligation to inquire, but should we happen to inquire about the world, then uh, the, the thinking tries to tries to resolve that, it tries to make those connections so like between the concepts that, uh, um, that, we've, um, that we've developed in us. And he, he goes into some detail about like, the um, cause effect, but how Herbert Spencer, he, he misses out this key point it's like in his description of what thinking is. I do think there's an interesting link to the, so the Socratic inquiry here. It's like the, the importance of actually asking questions in here, which um, is like implicit in, in what he's saying here. That's how we learn, we discover the world by asking questions, not be by told how it is. Uh, important point, especially for teachers like myself. Um, he then, having um, having presented this idea of the activity of thinking, it's like, I almost imagine it a little bit like a production line in a, in a very coarse way. He then goes on to say, so okay, so what does this thinking activity, as it as it occurs, as it sort of like takes place inside of us, uh, what does it do? Um, uh, or, or where does it where does it try to sort of like where does it try to place its activity? And first, we're it's like um, we are introduced to the idea that we direct thinking towards observation, and this is how concepts coming into being and 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 ideas. Um, but that also that the, the the thinker is also can become the object of observation, and it's also so uh, the. I become the object of my thinking, so like my, my body, my, my inner life, as so like all these type of things become an, uh, an object with uh, which thinking can also so like apply its activity uh, to. And uh, it's at this stage he um, talks, he, he uses this very potent, um, potent phrase, I live by the grace of thinking and describes it's like how we are a if it weren't for thinking uh, we wouldn't know we exist but this is the natural activity of thinking to produce like this this results in it's because of its because of the nature of the activity of thinking 
And uh, Max and I had a, a little bit of a conversation about this uh, on, an, on another form, this subject object. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this use of subject object is really interesting because if you look into the etymology of it uh, and so like pre-Cartesian ideas and what subject and object is and how the how Aristotle saw it, you've got this. I, I, I was looking for an image to summarise it. I've come up with a Mobius strip, which is like a lemniscate, but a lemniscate where the inner becomes the outer as well and. If we look at this shift into like what subject object is, I think this can be like a, an interesting way of understanding uh, yet again how different we think from the Greeks that we've that we've referenced uh, before. Um, and once you do that, you also <laughs> The, this this inner region of the soul that Stein has been uh, that's uh, also talked about several times. This this region of the soul that needs to be developed. You can begin to experience this as a substance in the same way that um, it seems like uh, Aristotle understood what the subject was in our in our modern day uh, terms. So it's that's it's, it's affected by something else. It's the that's that which is receiving a quality, if I if I could put it like that, where qu a quality is the op opposite of a substance. So th I think there's, it, I, I found that very interesting to so let's see this complete transformation, this 180 degree turn in, in the thinking there. He then goes on to uh, describe thinking from yet another angle, how it works in the soul and how um, it is uh, he, talk, he uses the term thinking consciousness, this, this emphasis on the idea that whatever enters into consciousness um, can become the subject of thinking. And uh, what's true for the outer life is also true for the inner life. Um, he then goes on to um, perhaps the core of the chapter where he's, he, he creates this uh, definition of the percept, which is also very interesting. He uses this term um, relationless aggregate that if he, he, I think he's using this as a, he, he's creating this idea in our mind to help us understand, experience more directly what, how the thinking activity unfurls itself by describing, trying to imagine ourselves in a, in a pre-thinking state, what that might be like and then describe how it's like, right, thinking so it sets into motion and, 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 and what happens uh, uh, to us then. Um, I have also, in, I think, um, the um, looking at uh, language and mental pictures there, how they come into being is also it's like a good, good way of, sort of like grappling, creating more content o around this idea. Um, so basically, he, um, he, he, he ends up saying that it's like everything which comes from um, wherever can be a percept, but it is nothing until it's been permeated by thinking. Uh, we cannot say anything um, about the world, which uh, we've heard him say several times, unless uh, it has been permeated by thinking. And uh, he then talks us through this, uh, we're walking down the um, an avenue of trees and we can become aware of our um, the subjective nature of our percept. Um, and he talks about qualitative and uh, quantitative quantitative uh, differences. So it's like the, you've got the mathematical side, they, um, the experience of the, the different sizes of the, the trees, which are purely mathematical. And then we've got the uh, qualitative, which might be based on our own, so like soul organisation or the, the the constitution of our body, and also this is very interesting um, because if you if you, if you draw that argument out, this is also turning the notion of objective and subjective on its head. That's like the percept becomes the thing which you, uh, it not instead of unifying us. It's that which is completely unique in all of us. So um, uh, that picture on the wall over there, 
uh, we've if you're all looking at it from very slightly different it's like camera angles different lighting and all that type of thing none of us are having the same visual experience but we can all say that it's a picture and he's using this idea to tease out the idea that is actually the concept it's the universality of thinking that we're recognizing but we place it on the picture um, and it is, it's, I think it's quite a subtle argument, but it's really interesting um, that uh, so rather than thinking being subjective, it's actually perception that's subjective. Um, and uh, I was uh, there's um, if I, I was thinking about David in our group here, he would have uh, might have appreciated this, but uh, with. Um, how can uh, as an example um uh, uh perhaps I, I, I might end up talking a little bit too uh too long if i if i talk on that example i'll i'll, I'll just let it uh, slip slip by for the moment okay um so after we've been introduced to this idea that like the thinking and uh, subjectivity is we have a different relationship to it um, he then so like, further develops the idea and says, look, basically our whole inner life can ultimately become a percept to us, i.e. something which can then be so, like, deepened, by, uh, deepened by thinking. Um, so, so our feelings, our mental pictures, our memory, our perception of self, they all become percepts which can be subjected to, to this uh, thinking activity. Um, and by once he's got to this stage, he's really laid the ground for uh, looking at uh, Berkeley and uh, Kant as like the the errors that they make in their thinking, um, according to him. Um, Berkeley is um, uh, so perhaps uh, you know. Um, when we when we take the inside when we take the outside world inside us we, we create these mental pictures and it's like the critical idealists they arrive at the conclusion that we can only ever know our mental uh, pictures and our inner states and this this sends their conclusions off in uh, different directions uh, one of them being Berkeley's, which is that's like um, there is no outer reality. I it's like it's, that's like the, the the mental pictures in my mind they're served up by God, and there isn't even an outer world. It's just uh, it's just um, well, he doesn't actually say it's an illusion. He says that this is a he says this is an interesting starting point um, uh, about which. I can't, I can't remember the exact wording, but um, he, he, he leaves it lying open there. So like Berkeley's, Berkeley's idea, just as, uh, as a possibility there, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't refute it. Uh, and then we come to Kant, and uh, it's like another form of critical idealism, which is also confused by the relationship between uh, the percept and thinking and the mental picture in the middle. And so like, instead of trying to resolve it Berkeley's way they create a, a thing in itself it's like there's there's a reality outside of ourselves which creates these but we can never know the the nature of this because we can only know about our subjective experience of it and he goes into details about uh, so like the how basically all uh, outer impressions become chemical stroke electrical activity in any of the respective organs of perception and that's all we can know as um inner beings so he's he's really select, helping us to explain uh how the confusion also like the worldviews that can arise through a confusion of like the real nature of according to him of what a uh, what a mental picture is what it can tell us about the world um, and uh, he finishes up the chapter by saying that um, these, uh, whilst, what was the phrase he uses? He says something like, never, never in history 
I'll just I'll just dig it up because it figures also a nicer a uh, nice little quote. Um, where is it here? Um, it would be hard to find in the history of human culture another edifice of thought which has been built up with greater ingenuity and which yet on closer analysis collapses into nothing. And he describes how critical idealists are using naive uh, realist assumptions to prove their point. And he, he doesn't say that therefore they are wrong. He just says that their powers to convince are zero. And just to really drive home the point, that's like he, he quotes a little bit of Schopenhauer um, saying the same thing about the sun and the earth, but what about the eye that sees this uh, sun and earth? Yeah. That was, uh, that was chapter four in, I don't know, was it 10 minutes or something like that? Thanks, Angus. The world as percept, and it really brings home um, the special position that we find ourselves in once we have become attuned to how thinking activity itself is not like all of the other perceptions. Um, in regard to the critical idealists, I'm reminded of this funny line from Whitehead where he says, some, some people express themselves as though brains and sense organs and nerves were the only real things in an entirely imaginary world, right? Making a similar point to Steiner. So let's see, I see Max and then Jacob. Uh, go ahead, Max. Hi, uh, can folks hear me? Just want to Great, thank you. I just wanted to pick up on a point that Angus made. Um, uh, starting, I guess, with the way that Steiner uh, contrasts his starting point to Hegel's starting point. Hegel starting with, I guess, the concept, uh, where Steiner uh, starting with thinking per se. I think it's also worth contrasting Steiner's starting point to, in a certain way, like the, the opposite polarity to Hegel. And that would be something like Descartes or maybe Kant to some extent. And the idea of starting rather with on the one hand, you have Hegel starting with like objective idealism. On the other hand, you have some uh, the starting point of, of the cogito, for instance, or the I think. And that would be um, like in Steiner's idea, the mistaken assumption would be like, um, uh, would be starting with, starting with the subject uh, as though it's already been constituted by thinking, whereas Steiner is trying to point out that it's only through thinking that we're able to you know, differentiate subject and object into the polarity that that strikes us as so familiar, and, and so I just I just thought it would be helpful to um uh, to lay out the kind of implicit I guess uh, m manner in which Steiner is trying to thread the needle, so to speak, between Hegel to the one side and somebody like Descartes and maybe Kant on the other side. Um, if anyone wants to pick up on that, I'd be happy to. Or I'd be interested to hear more. Otherwise, I'll. Um, I'll uh, stop for now. On my hand. Go ahead, Jacob. Sounds like you might have something. Uh, yes, it's sort of, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of connecting up to what uh, Max was saying um, a little bit, uh, but also um, to the uh, question of the, the nature of the percept. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start with the second one and, and make the connection afterwards. Uh, <clears throat> something that um, I think is maybe expressed a little more clearly when you um, read the philosophy of freedom together with uh, truth and science, which is this shorter work that was um, Steiner's doctoral dissertation. Um, and I think uh, uh, Kulavind also discusses this difference that there seem to be two different accounts of the nature of perception that Steiner gives. One it, um, presents the sphere of pure perception as if it was completely undifferentiated and unstructured at all. So it's kind of like uh, you could talk about it as, as the, just the emergence of objects of any sort, the emergence of a, a structured um, field of experience. That's kind of like a more basic sense in which thinking is needed in order to, um, uh, to structure perception, just the fact that we perceive anything. 
Um, and then there's sort of the second <clears throat> slightly more sophisticated level where he seems to be talking about perception as being made up of objects that are distinguished but unrelated or, or they're somehow distinguished to some extent but uh, you know maybe they're not uh, like he gives this example of um, an unimportant organ in an organism being treated as uh, as as if it were as important as as the heart say or, so so uh, yeah so there seem to be these two steps one is is in one sense he's saying that perception without thinking is kind of like matter in aristotle it doesn't have any form at all so it's kind of it may as well not exist it's it's sort of like this purely potential something um and then the next step being you know a world, world that's already to some extent structured by thinking but where the connections between the percepts are not um not clear and that gives rise to further questioning and that second stage seems to be somehow connected to the emergence of the subject as well that that um we kind of emerge from from this undifferentiated um uh, so that was uh, the, I just thought that was a, a, a worthwhile thing to point to. And the other thing about um, that Max was talking about uh, about Steiner beginning with uh, with thinking, I just wanted to share with you a very short quote from a book uh, some of you may know uh, by um, the Japanese philosopher Nishida. Uh, it's his first book, An Inquiry into the Good, um, and uh, I just sharing it because it's it's strikingly similar in you know, the way he phrases it to, to what Stein is saying. Uh, in summary, thinking and experience are identical. Although we can see a relative difference, there is no absolute distinction between them. Uh, this is the bit especially. I'm not saying that thinking is merely individual and subjective. Pure experience can, as discussed earlier, transcend the individual person. Although it may sound strange, uh, sorry, that, that is, uh, it is not that this is the bit. Uh, it is not that there is experience because there is an in, an individual, but that there is an individual because there is experience. I thought <laughs> I thought why I wanted to share this is because it's it's interesting that Nishida is in some ways very similar to to Steiner on some of these issues, but he doesn't seem to distinguish to the same extent. As Steiner does between perception and thinking. So he, where, where Steiner is talking about the the way in which the activity of thinking transcends the opposition between subject and object, Nishida has this slightly different perspective where he uses this idea of pure experience, which is somehow also an activity pr prior to uh, to the split between subject and object. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the fact that for, for Steiner, it's not just that there's some activity that's prior to that split, but that specifically that it's thinking seems um, seems to be very significant. Hmm. Thanks. And I guess I see your hand. Um, <clears throat> if I may, I want to offer something in response to what Jacob has, has raised um, about perceptual experience and I brought this up a bit last time and the question and I'll, I'll have to return to Steiner's dissertation um, to get a sense for the different way that he's apparently describing perception there versus how he has described it in the first few chapters of the philosophy of freedom because the question for me and I'm glad you brought up uh, Nishida who's seems to me to be very much drawing on William James's account of a so-called pure experience before subject and object because for James yes, yes. yeah my schooling in in James and his sort of um, phenomenology led me to resist initially Steiner's account of uh, perception as a sort of relationless aggregate because um, the radical empiricists like James and, and Whitehead later would say no the the datum of experience contains its own interconnections. And there's a sense in which um, experience as an infant uh, would have it is 
we could either consider it a kind of unbroken gestalt, where it begins as this sort of wholeness that is then later fragmented by thought into particular objects, which can then be related by thought. So thought here is both analytic and synthetic. Um, and that would be my, my tendency more you know, to understand this process. And I don't think it's, again, in conflict with what Steiner is saying, though it's unclear to me. Um, one last thing I'll say is James's statement uh, in Principles of Psychology that an infant's experience can be characterized as a blooming, buzzing confusion is often, almost always, misunderstood, I think, as James suggesting that the infant is experiencing a world of fragmentary uh, percepts or separate objects. But the, the, pay close attention to the metaphor blooming. He's talking about an organic process here. Uh, buzzing, I think the, the metaphor here is like um, bees uh, hopping from flower to flower. Uh, and confusion is, the emphasis here is on fusion. And so there's this unbroken wholeness and this organic unity to the infant's experience. Uh, which, as thinking comes more into its own, gets broken up, but it's kind of an alchemical process that thinking engages in with the prime, the prima materia of perception. It separates and then it brings back together, right? And so thinking can do either of these. So anyways, um, <clears throat> I, I think you and I are struggling, Jacob, with a similar uh, distinction in, in Steiner's ways of characterizing the perceptual field. Um, Yes, yes. If, if, sorry, if I may just very quickly, because um, I think that's, yeah, I, I, my, my sense is that um, uh, partly, you know, relating to the, this idea of the evolution of consciousness, that what he's ultimately probably assuming is that there is actually a, already a unity um, with, from which the individual subject somehow emerges partially by separating from it. Almost like um, uh, an analogy that that I found somewhere. Uh, uh, I forget who who used it, but it seemed perfect. Was the image of a, a figure in a painting or a tapestry stepping out of the tapestry? <laughs> so the, there's an original unity, but then in in trying to understand that unity, the you know we we end up having to think about what you know, what would have perception been like without the contribution of thinking? But I, I don't think Stein is saying that there really was some original primitive state that, you know, was formless. It's it's rather that in trying to understand it, we we rely on this kind of hypothetical. Um, yeah. What do you think, Angus? There's at least at least four interesting points that you that you brought up there. Um, I won't try to tackle all of them, but um, uh, one um, uh, is Lorenzo. Lorenzo, did you, I don't know if you've looked at the Archiati, Pietro Archiati. He he talks about this yeah. uh, realm as null. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. And he says it a thousand times in this series of conferences that he does. And at first, it's like a, 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 a challenge to say, what are you saying? This is the, it, perception is nothing. But as you begin to live into the experience that he's trying to communicate, that it really is a nothing and everything to us until thinking actually starts. It's like unfurling this activity. It's like it adds another lens through which you can sort of begin to appreciate um, how, how Steiner might be, how Steiner might be seeing this. Um, I think uh, Goethe is sort of like stamped all over this, uh, this chapter as well, because what he, the, the idea that he's really um, moving towards hasn't said it so sort of like explicitly in this chapter. Recording in progress. Um, but he's saying that's like reality is concept plus percept, and it's a like if, to take your your example with a plant, uh, Matt. It's like that concept, that uh, that um, that archetype, or that idea is living in that plant. Um, it's always there. It's just that 
it's like prior to thinking, we're, we're incapable of linking the concept that lives in the plant to the perception that we're having. And as we it's like permeate nature, the world around us, and ourselves, of course, as well, as we discover who we are ourselves, then we are, then we are approaching, it's like a, a, a closer picture of reality. And this, this word nothing is, is very potent in uh, Archiati's uh, description, uh, uh, explanation of what's going on in this part of um, uh, the, the philosophy of freedom. Because uh, it's like one of one of Goethe's one of my favourite Goethe quotes is uh, where he uh, is like out of your nothing I hope to find the all it's like I it's like the, the the whole essence of the universe um, and I think we can relate this also to this idea of percept that Steiner is trying to bring up here it is a nothing until we begin to take it apart which leads me to. Um, the, the final part when you were it's like when you were thinking about um, when you were describing if I understood it well um, um, the, the uh, Jacob I can't remember the name of the Japanese philosopher that you mentioned but what I was recognizing in that is de a definite sort of like oriental feel to if I read if I read the, the Gita's or this type of thing, they talk about this uh, this pr primordial uh, state, and that you've got to remove thinking to be able to experience the whole again. And what might well have been true, so like X thousand years ago, when so like this was the highest form of wisdom, uh, Steiner here is saying, uh, according to him. That is no longer the case. We cannot go back and it's like undo this thinking that we've done, this this, this development of a, of a self-consciousness. No, instead, what we've got to do is we've got to use the thinking, uh, the thinking activity that lives within us to reconnect with the universe. Um, and if I could make one more point, it's like connecting Eastern uh, mysticism with so like Steiner's uh, perception. In Eastern mysticism, it's about dissolution of the ego. You, so like you've got to dissolve back into the into the into the uh, into the spiritual world, into the cosmos, to reunite with Brahma, or to 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 uh, to achieve Nirvana. And of course, this is the polar opposite of what Steiner says. It's no, we don't dissolve back into the universe to become nothing we reintegrate with the universe with love that that becomes the me the medium the the um the experience by which we reconnect with everything and love and freedom and uh, individuality they are they are at the essence of um of uh this this book for me at least yeah well said angus um <clears throat> appreciate that reminder that we can't simply the the the, the path to the spiritual world must be uh, achieved in freedom not by uh, regression to an infantile state as it were um, Alex, you're next. Yes, hi. So I, I was also just trying to follow a bit the conversation and Jacob's remarks. Uh, yeah, in a little bit the sense that it's not a returning to infancy. I, I didn't really, I'm not sure if I, when you spoke of pure perception, if that is what I would call a pre-verbal state of consciousness. Um, but we spoke about the infant uh, and the conscious, the consciousness there that is evolving into this the separate state of ego, subject and object, which for me is the one that we can or in which 
verbal discourse and verbal thinking is most expressive. And what I believe in Steiner is that he develops, I usually call it a post-verbal consciousness um, that is developed in his exercises that he that are that appear in the supra sensible type of thinking that he speaks about so i mean maybe that's also what's connected with when he speaks about thinking that is not related to physical to the physical body he uses this expression sometimes um and for me it's interesting because I think you, Angus, spoke about this in your introduction, that concepts are not verbal. I mean, we can speak about them, but they are not verbal. And for me, with my experience of doing a little bit of Goetheanism, is that um, studying and approaching an object or a phenomena through this more super sensible consciousness is that uh, my apprehension of a phenomena becomes less and less verbal or I can speak less and less about what I perceive or understand. But uh, phenomena itself becomes more and more vivid for my thinking. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting process there that I think is going on from verbal dualistic consciousness into a more unified or a more intimate consciousness with the world. Um, now I was looking here for a reference, but I'm not finding right. I, I, I'm, I'm not finding it right now. I might try and find it and share it later, but it's from a journal. Maybe some of you know it. Janice had, it had some very good essays on Goetheanism. And one author there speaks about the difference between thinking about the world and thinking with the world, which feels also, it expresses very well this sense of participating with the world more and more and more. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks, Alex. I'm just, I was reminded in <clears throat> the difference between concepts. You're muted, Matt. Oops, thought I clicked it. I was just thinking, uh, thank you, Alex, for that, about how Steiner is often reminding his listeners that he's using words and metaphors derived from the sense perceptible world to talk about spiritual realities and that the examples might sound silly unless you're able to uh, participate in the world in the way that that he is advising and so the words aren't going to get you there in other words um, if you don't have the concepts <clears throat> um, Daniel you're next go ahead and unmute yeah th thank you for this discussion I think I'm coming in not quite connected to the reading or, or all of you, but so I hope this is helpful. What uh, is, um, I guess I'm thinking about often this gap that people have had with the idea of Hamlet, like that, that thinking then prevents us from acting. And there's this huge gap that is very hard to go over. So I love this idea that thinking is an action and, and our participation is actually bringing us closer to connection with our perceptions, connection to the infantile unity, you know, and that, and that what we're needing to do is to keep going, go further. Like maybe thinking is what got us here and let's keep thinking. <laughs> and um, it's, it's, I'm also thinking this idea that if, uh, if thinking is this way in which the humans kind of wake up inside and relate to the perceptions. It's like we come into our seat and then um, 
this idea of if perceptions are feeding us our food in which we're digesting, that um, that we're in some sort of proper relationship with them, that that yes, the perceptions are part of it, but our thinking it allows us to use the perceptions as if like they're the tools rather than we're being inundated by perceptions and, and sort of overwhelmed by them. So I guess my feeling is um, that as we, uh, you know, I'm thinking of William Blake, how he talks about there's four ways of, of imagining. And if, you've, if, if we're simply just like kind of dumbly perceiving things, we see kind of a flat world. But if we can kind of think, we can kind of see through our perceptions, we're seeing through our eyes rather than in, in, in that direction. And so um, I, it, this brings me up wondering um, if, there, if that relationship between concept and percept, like there's a dialogue happening, there's an alchemical digestion happening that's allowing us to see greater unities and holes. If um, I'm confused a little bit between the difference between um, subject and subjective and objective, um, is there a way in which if we see things in some sort of super subjective way, I don't know if this makes sense, but I'm just telling, seeing if this helps anybody. Um, if, if every, can we see things as everything is subjective in a way that's thus a, a unity? You know, it, it, not that everything is like, oh, everyone has their own point of view, so we can't get together. But it's because everything is a seeing, um, it, there's a there's an objective unity or super subjective objective unity there. So I, I hope this isn't too chaotic and random. But thank you for being here. Thanks, Daniel. It, it, I mean, to summarize what I'm hearing you say, as simple as I could, I would say it's perception that makes us particular and thinking raises us to the universal and in the integration of our thinking with our perception we become individuals right it's it's in that meeting place and that integ integration that individuality arises we don't want to be totally particular lost in our percepts and we don't want to be merely universal because we're not just disembodied angels like we have individuality right in our thinking helps us bring the two together if we do it consciously and with freedom. Ashton, you're up. Thank you. So um, this is my third time reading this and um, I was so uh, grateful for this critique <laughs> when I first read it in this chapter of that kind of I guess, physiological critical idealism or just, you know, um, the reduction of the inner life to uh, processes of the body. Um, but when I was reading it this time, I just wanted to share this experience. Uh, uh, so I'm also, you know, as many of you know, uh, very deep into Barfield's work. And so I, I feel like in this chapter, you know, with his critique of, you know, very familiar critique of naive realism, but as well uh, the physiological critical idealism. He's really trying to raise up into our consciousness what Barfield calls the residue of unresolved positivism. And so I felt myself, uh, my experience of reading this chapter this time, especially like with this emphasis on, you know, even the sense organs as being percepts, this I don't know if it was Aristotle, I can't remember who, uh, which Platonist was, uh, if it was a Platonist associated with this phrase, but the idea that um, the body is in the soul or that the soul is in all things, <laughs> that, that um, I guess that reading this chapter made that more of a, an experience for me. <laughs> so anyway, just wanted to share that. Yeah, thanks, Ashton. It's it's um, a neat inversion, um, but it's it seems to me like it, at least passing the the lower threshold, as it were, to grasp that even 
you know, in all of our materialistic habits of thought, imagining that, oh, well, obviously the eyes produce sight and the ears produce hearing, and imagining that we actually understand what we mean when we say that, when really there's a huge gap staring us in the face between the ear and hearing, like, or the eye and seeing, like, we only have percepts of these organs too, so yeah, it's, if you, if you grok that, it's quite transformative. We're already on our way into the spiritual world, I think, at that point. Uh, Lorenzo, you're next. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, um, since Angus talked about nothingness, uh, I had something to to say. It's just uh, I wanted to underline something about uh, our matter and uh, Steiner's discourse. Uh, the fact that um, there is a kind of Gordian knot, let's say, of epistemology of knowledge that he makes kind of clear through these uh, first chapters of the book. Because uh, each of the hypotheses that he's going to uh, uh, to prove a fallacious and then to reject are simpler than the one that we are finally getting to. And for example, when if we if we leave critical idealism, let's say Barclay's position, he says that there are only perceptions. Well, we have to to leave that uh, and uh, coming from the idea that we can only um, uh, get any knowledge through per perceptions and keep that point. At the same time, Steiner says that he wants to, uh, that we need to uh, show what the function of perception is in building the perception itself. Well, this means that we have to uh, uh, take uh, into account more variables than we we had with the the former hypothesis. We we uh, we don't just take uh, reality as it is. We don't just take reality as perceptions, but we have to step beyond that. We have to keep more variables, and this goes beyond, uh, against Occam's razor. We are used to Occam's razor as uh, 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 a tool for for thought, and uh, it's not an absolute rule, you know. But it's just something that is useful most of the times. But the fact that, uh, uh, at least in Steiner's opinion, but mine too, uh, to get to uh, a good working hypothesis for knowledge and epistemology, we have to finally take into account an hypothesis that is much more complex than uh, all the uh, the more popular ones is i think the the explanation for why esotericism for example is called so why uh, does uh, the, the the deep true knowledge have to be hidden essentially this doesn't usually make very very much sense uh, when they present it to you but, uh, and also there's another problem. If, uh, if this knowledge has already been discovered is something that uh, humanity always had in its uh, traditions, why is it so hard to, uh, to make it known and to, to write, for example, um, explanations like Steiner is trying to do here and many others have tried? Why doesn't this working hypothesis just conquer everybody and why is it also also always a minority position and I, I think this is very important it's built in with the evolutionary idea that the fact that even the, the stage we are going through is something needed why because we have to develop uh, new ways of, uh, of thinking and this fact that we we still have to use Occam's razor but we also have uh, to uh, go beyond it and uh, uh, to 
to take into account yeah uh, a much more complex working hypothesis i think is is the the core of, of all these these questions it means and mystery at least to me and i'm curious to to know about your opinions about this and um, thanks yeah thanks lorenzo I, I couldn't help but think of plato's divided line analogy in the republic and why is it so hard for people to to grasp the relationship between the intelligible and the sensible and in the same dialogue in which the divided line is articulated there's the allegory of the cave and your answer is right there when you first turn around and face the light not only are you blinded but when you do begin to see things and try to talk to the people who are still chained they think you're nuts like right and so um it's it warns uh it, it, people are not um easily uh yeah compelled to pursue what at first it's like the zen koan where you know before enlightenment uh there's rivers and mountains and trees and then all of a sudden as you are on the path the rivers and mountains and trees become not rivers and mountains and trees anymore and then after enlightenment no it's rivers and mountains and trees again but that interim period is very harrowing it's difficult it's confusing nobody knows what you're talking about um, and you seem crazy. So I think that's part of the reason. But yeah, I think I prefer Plato's beard to Occam's razor on these questions. Uh, Jacob, sorry, I know that's a little cute, but I had to. <laughs> um, so I just uh, wanted to very briefly return to the, um, that uh, analogy I gave before of the, the somebody emerging from a tapestry or a painting um, and, and the question that these uh, different uh, levels of, of perception uh, because uh, I think the other thing that's worth noting is when Stein is talking about perception he isn't just talking about sense perception because he identifies thinking as initially a, a percept among other percepts for instance um, so so I think the the to me it seems like the crucial uh, or one of the crucial distinctions that, uh, uh, between thinking and perception in this broader sense that he's using it is is that perception is given in a way that thinking isn't. So it's not it's not specifically just sense perception because he seems to be working with a broader sense of uh, of observation which includes thoughts, for instance. Um, so it's it's almost as if he's he's treating it as if there's this single field experiential field that includes sense perceptions thoughts uh, etc you know uh, um but the, the other uh, quick thing was uh, it's something that that Kulavind actually uh, mentions and and Nishida too interestingly um it seems to me like part of the the transition uh, from um the, the transition in which the the separated self emerges in the first place has to do with a sort of breakdown in in a kind of total intelligibility that that if you imagine a world in which all of the conceptual connections are already present in in your experience and the the experiential field is completely covered so to speak by concepts it, it's actually difficult to imagine how a uh, a separate self would even exist you would just have the you know you just have this total picture where everything makes sense everything has its place and you would be one of those things which have their place in the in the total image so it seems almost a little bit uh, kind of uh, you know more cognitive less practical but a little bit like uh, the way heidegger too talks about the hammer becoming thematic when it ceases functioning <laughs> as a as a hammer, it seems to be something like that happening as well in in, in Steiner's who that that it's, yeah. Hmm. Thanks, Jacob. That's helpful. Um, Angus, go ahead. Yeah, and I just realised there's one huge important point, at least for me, that I have completely neglected to talk about. Um, I'm just going to read the quote and then why, why I think it's so significant, okay? So this is like towards the end of the chapter. 
He says, no objection can be made to this assertion as long as I am merely referring to the general fact that the percept is partly determined by the organization of myself as subject. The matter would appear very different if we were in a position to say just what part is played by our perceiving in the bringing forth of a percept. And, and then he goes on. Why is this so important? <clears throat> because as, you're, as several people have alluded to here, that you've got the mystery of perception, how we perceive, how so like light turns into chemicals, electricity and uh, electrical impulses, and that's sort of like somehow is connected to the soul. That is a mystery. But there is an element of soul where no such mystery exists. And that is in the exceptional state that he introduced us to in chapter three. We know its providence 100%. We created it. And this is, this is absolutely, uh, this is so important that I'm, just like, I'm a little bit shocked that I didn't talk about it uh, uh, earlier. Um, I, I know on previous readings I've, I've missed it uh, or I felt confused by this, this statement, but it really is of, um, of uh, quite some significance in my, in my opinion. Uh, in the exceptional state, we've got something unique going on. And uh, as he says in chapter three, this is the way into that region of the soul. Yeah, thanks for that, Angus. Connecting us back to the exceptional state mentioned in chapter three. I think that's that's crucial here. Jeff, I see your hand. Um, wow. So this is a extremely deeply personal chapter to me. And uh, the farther this conversation goes, the more I am hesitant to speak at all. But um, what Angus just said about the it that... Um, that we're creating, he, he creates a new level of this it that's that's being worked upon, let's say, and fashioned as an instrument that will cross this divide between subject and object. And he introduces here the mental picture as, as sort of the connective tissue. And that mental picture can be just a merely personal experience, but it's going to be a very personal experience. And this is why I think we feel like we're in the wilderness at 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 these junctures in in this. Um, um, or I, I, let's say I do at this moment in relationship to this chapter. I mean, I, I sat and and worked out this chapter almost uh, as meticulously as I possibly could. And there's the there's just so much mystery in it as it relates to the mystery of perception and who's perceiving, because he brings in over over these few chapters that the the whatever the individual is, the iness, he brings it in even stronger in this chapter because he says it is the um, let's turn our attention to the eye that perceives to the subject that perceives and that subject that perceives is the subject that we create ourselves as an instrument to overcome the divide that is terrible <laughs> I, I wish it weren't so that goes to sort of uh, uh of uh, uh who was it that was saying why why isn't this wisdom just available to us that lorenzo was saying it's terrible man i uh, that that this freedom is not going to be easy and um um, and it's also to me, um, devastatingly beautiful that I think what we're talking about here is, is, uh, uh, an epistemology of the Holy spirit. Um, and I, I just leave that picture there cause, um, um, I, I think there is the epistemology within this work that reveals the Holy spirit within every individual. Um, and that, that, uh, that is what is universal in the holiest of holies. Mm. Thank you, Jeff. I think that ought to be the last word. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Oh, go ahead, Ashton. Jonathan's hand is up. I'm not sure. If oh, it's... sorry, Jonathan. I didn't see it was blurring with the yeah with the background. Go ahead, Jonathan. You can have the last word. 
Well, it's just really to echo um, Angus and Jeff, because the in the original German, apparently the chapter has 33 paragraphs, and the, and the middle paragraph, the 17th, is how is it that we are compelled to make these continual corrections to our observations? And it really strikes me, normally kind of thinking is the mystery to us, because, you know, the world we perceive is very obvious. It's there, we've investigated it. Well, we, we know what's going on. But he does make this reversal where actually thinking, um, we know what's going on in thinking. It's so much part of us and, and we instantly know, you know why one thought follows another. We can, it's kind of just plain. It might be hard to sort of explicate it, but we've connected those concepts. So it's plain. So then, uh, but why do percepts come to us? Why, you know, perhaps this gestalt is not for us complete? Why are we compelled to think about it? And it, I have to say it's interesting that this chapter f finishes with that question still. It's the, the previous three chapters seem to kind of neatly sort of come to a bit of a conclusion, but this one says we haven't got to it. We, we now have to... Um, um, what happens to the percept, to look at what happens to the percept in our perceiving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's left us with quite a cliffhanger. All right, so uh, chapter five next week, the act of knowing. We'll use the same Zoom link. I'm pretty sure it'll it'll work fine next time. And uh, yeah, have a great week, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good week.